Coming up on Market to Market. The Agriculture Department says America's row crops are in their best shape in decades. And would-be traders go online to learn the basics and complexities of commodity trading. Those stories and market analysis with Dan Huber, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, July 25 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Consumer prices rose modestly last month as motorists endured higher prices at the pump. The government reported this week that its consumer price index, a key barometer of inflation, rose three-tenths of a percent in June. Food costs inched up one-tenth of a percent in their smallest gain since January. Energy prices, however, increased significantly, driven largely by a 3% spike in the cost of gasoline. But stripping out the volatile food and energy sectors, so-called core prices rose just one-tenth of a percent. One place where prices are definitely not rising is in the grain markets. And the freefall continued again this week after the Agriculture Department reported that America's dominant row crops are in their best shape in decades. In its latest crop progress report, USDA rated 76% of the U.S. corn crop in good to excellent condition. That's the highest rating for this time in July since 1994, when 86% garnered those lofty ratings. Heading into the critical pollination phase, 56% of the crop is silking, up more than 20 points from the previous week. And with extended weather forecasts calling for favorable conditions to continue, USDA is calling for a record average yield in excess of 165 bushels per acre. Similar conditions abound in America's soybean fields, where 73% of the crop is rated in the good to excellent range. 60% of the nation's soybeans are blooming as they too are off to their best start in 20 years. With three-fourths of the nation's winter wheat already in the bin, the government reports 84% of the spring variety is headed and 70% of the crop is in good to excellent condition. Bumper grain harvests and lower feed costs are a favorable development for livestock producers. But the price of forage is on the rise in some areas, especially out west. Nearly half of America's haying and grazing areas are in rough shape, with the worst being in California, where 90% of the pasture and rangeland is rated fair to very poor. And with 38% of the nation's cotton setting bulls, more than half the crop is rated in good to excellent condition. With record grain production seemingly becoming more likely with each passing day, corn prices are approaching a five-year low, and the pressure is on to manage that price risk effectively. For those who had the insight and the good fortune to forward contract a portion of their grain earlier this year, or hedge at least some of it in the futures markets, the blow won't be quite as bad. But selling off the combine this fall in the cash market will likely be a recipe for some of the lowest prices of the year. Make no mistake, commodity marketing is a complex affair with significant risks for both buyers and sellers. But entrepreneurs are working to demystify the process. And as David Miller explains, an innovative program called GrainBridge has become a popular online tool for agricultural educators and students of the trade. Balancing risk against reward on the farm is a way of life. Gone are the days of making decisions based on a shoebox full of receipts and passing on the techniques of how to maintain that delicate balance to the next generation usually occurs after family members become business partners. But two Nebraska entrepreneurs weren't satisfied with the way information was being gathered for producers. And we just decided there's got to be a better way to, to help our businesses and the producer manage risk and bring all these components together from, from crop insurance to 
to your brokerage, to your cash grain management, to the planning, uh, it seemed like it's all in different Excel spreadsheets and in file cabinets. And so we, we just decided with the technology that's out there, we got to bring it all together. Pat Cruzy and his best friend Mark Frank took their more than 40 years of combined experience in agricultural financial planning and risk management and applied it to the problem. The pair enlisted the aid of Chafik Barbar, a computer programmer with banking experience, and the three partners launched GrainBridge in 2007. After two years of development, the first software went out the door. The heart of the program allows producers to consider risk factors like input costs and balance them against the potential rewards of cash marketing and futures trading in a real-time environment. While it's not the only program of its kind, GrainBridge was one of the first in the marketplace, and its list of clients include independent bankers, consultants, and commodity brokers. One of the company's first customers was Farm Credit Services of America, a farm lender with more than $21 billion in assets. In 2010, FCS America began offering the innovative product to some of its 52,000 stockholder owners. But the Omaha, Nebraska-based agricultural lender came up with a different application for the software. Well, at some point we said, hey, our producers love this. It, it met every expectation. It was going great. And we thought, you know, where is another opportunity for us to be able to utilize this tool? And we said, you know, one of our focuses on, is on the future of agriculture. And so we said, when, when they're starting to talk about marketing and risk management in the high schools, wouldn't it be nice if we could provide this tool to those classrooms and give them some experiential learning? Could go back to your other corn enterprise. Cruzy, Frank, and Barbar always had an educational component in mind but there just weren't enough hours in the day to bring the idea from concept to completion. FCS America agreed to act as distributor for GrainBridge and in 2012 began giving the program to a limited number of vocational agriculture teachers and FFA advisors free of charge. The beta group included 35 instructors in Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. We want to go short, which means we're going to sell a futures contract. Initial feedback was positive, but almost to a person, the request was made for a curriculum to help guide instructors on the best use of the program. Grainbridge responded by hiring Kim Kidder, a teacher with more than 15 years of experience in the classroom, to help design an educational component. The curriculum, released in the summer of 2013, explains the finer details of risk management, including more advanced concepts like futures and options trading. Students learn terminology, and teachers can measure performance with worksheets and computer-based projects. The program can be interfaced with data from the CME group, or the instructor can act as an elevator operator for the entire class. So far, FCS America has distributed GrainBridge to more than 200 classrooms in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And the company continues to absorb all the costs for the academic use of the program. Michael Weber, a vocational agriculture teacher in Rock Valley, Iowa, was one of the early adopters. In nearly 15 years of teaching, Weber has used several different models to show his students how to manage risk. Everything is it's always, you know, why, why not try something? I'm always willing to try something for the first time and kind of see how it works. Um, the part that really kind of took my interest was that it was a real-world application that farmers are actually using out there. Not that there aren't other things that farmers are using, but this was kind of a newer one. Um, I think some of the other type of programs that are out there kind of just have a little bit of an older look to it, and that doesn't really appeal to kids. And so the, the user interface was very user-friendly for the kids, and I think it was really easy for them to catch on and to use. Um, the hard part about it what this year was that the curriculum came out and I sat right next to the kids and we learned together. Some of Weber's students use actual data from their family operations to gain skills with GrainBridge that go beyond agriculture. There's a lot of ways to manage your risk, which I'm not all 100% uh, sure about, but I'm just getting to learn about them here in ag class. So this is probably the first time that I've heard about them, like futures and options and stuff like that. GrainBridge is a good, like, it's a good budgeting tool. We get to keep track of our expenses, our break-even prices, all that stuff. And it's not just good for egg, it's good for a lot of things. You should be budgeting 
keeping track of your money, what you do in real life. And Jill Peterson, a first-year teacher, also has enjoyed success with Grainbridge in her Blair, Nebraska classroom. Yep, so use December. Initially, I was just excited. Um, May, about half of my ag business and marketing class comes from a production background, and the other half has no concept. And so to bring agriculture to students in a real, as much of a real-life way as you can numbers-wise was huge. Um, I also really liked that it had curriculum with it, and so they not only provided me a real-time system that real producers are using right now, but they connected it to the education world. Uses futures contracts to protect themselves from losses and avoids risk. Okay. Emily Bledsoe grew up in rural Nebraska, where her parents grow pumpkins and operate a corn maze during harvest season. Bledsoe got a new perspective on risk management when Peterson started using the software in class. I knew absolutely nothing. It was absolutely crazy. And, um, and then she pulled up this um, Greenbridge software, and um, I had no idea what she was talking about. And then she, we've been doing this for weeks and weeks and weeks now, and it's really interesting. And so how is that influencing us and our bean trends? For the Greenbridge staff, development is a never-ending activity. As suggestions come in from those using the program, improvements are made to the software. And Cruzy remains upbeat about helping the next generation of farmers and educators develop effective risk management strategies. Everybody wants the tools. Nobody says no. Uh, it's just a matter of when do we get to it and how do we implement it. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. Next, the Market to Market report. Grain prices were mixed this week as wheat staged a modest rally while the nearby corn prices fell again on notions of record production. For the week, September wheat gained six cents while the nearby corn contract moved eight cents lower. Old crop soybeans bucked the bearish trend as the September contract rose 10 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with a gain of $6.60 per ton. In the softs, cotton declined again this week as the December contract lost $2.39 per hundred weight. In the dairy market, August Class III milk gained 17 cents, while the deferred contract moved 71 cents higher. Over in livestock, cattle prices moved back into record territory as the August contract gained $7.48. Nearby feeders advanced by $6.60 to settle at an, settle at an all-time high, but the decline in hog prices continued as the August contract lost nearly $3.50. In the financials, the euro declined by 10 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil advanced by 14 cents per barrel. Comex Gold lost $6 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained 3.5 points to settle at 6.34 even. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Dan Huber. Dan, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we're excited to have you. We've got, we saw wheat market stage a bit of a rally. We're mm -hmm. up a nickel this week. Have we hit the bottom? Does it look like we're going to see some support from here on out? You know, we've had about two weeks now of actually pretty stable trade, which is encouraging. I mean, and it just stands to reason the market has to quit going down before it can go back up. So that said, you know, with the grains, particularly corn and wheat, when they do bottom, they tend to get in extended sideways patterns. Looks like we could be into the beginning stages of that. And there absolutely was no positive news out there in the market this week. The, the export side of it, the Black Sea owns the world trade at this point. Uh, the, uh, the crop data coming out of the Dakotas on the quality tour really showed very substantial yields in the uh, spring wheat up there. So it's not like it had good news to turn it around, yet we stayed stable. So it's, you know, we always think that it, a good sign is if you receive bearish news and you don't react to it, you know, it probably says the market's heard enough of the bad and uh, at, least, at least wants to uh, start fishing for something new or something a little more positive at this point. So Maybe we're finding a little bit of resiliency at these correct, prices. Correct, correct. And, yeah, and certainly we're not seeing it in big exports numbers. The export sales this week were uh, modest at best. I mean, they certainly weren't disappointing, but, you know, nothing to get anybody excited about either. Uh, but, but that said, like I say, we've heard this. We've heard the story now for several months. Uh, the market, I think, is just a little bit tired of playing the bear. We, the crop's technically not going to get significantly larger than it has already, so we have factored that into the, into the price value. So, so uh, you know, a few weeks of stabilization, and you know, we could then maybe start talking about a, a corrective rally to the upside. So, so advice for producers, as you mentioned, we have seen uh, fairly <clears throat> decent yields coming mm -hmm. out of the crop tours on the spring wheat so far. For producers in that situation, d just hold on and wait and see if we get that little rally. For wheat, I, I, that is the one market I think it's probably okay to hold the 
the physical without having it priced. Yes, I think we could uh, turn around with a nice corrective rally during the month of August, maybe up into Labor Day or something. And I, I would reward that. I don't think we're going to see any market get carried away to the upside. Uh, the Europeans are a little slow on their harvest, but it's, it's uh, the quality is such it's going to be mostly feed wheat, but great uh, great yields. I think the uh, the Russian crop is going to be three to four million metric ton higher than initially thought. So, yeah, you, it's pretty difficult to think we're going to get carried away on the upside, but that's certainly not to say you couldn't see 10% rallies. So 50, 60 cents and uh, then time get close to, time to that to $6 them. mark and Correct. pull the trick. Exactly. Well, now let's jump down into the corn market. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a big crop. That's the topic all over the place. Absolutely. How, how big are, are you thinking? What is the trade anticipating as far as size goes? You know, what the trade has really factored in at this point is probably uh, maybe even a little conservative from some of the numbers you're hearing. Uh, Landworth, who is a, uh, a satellite technology company, did put out an estimate this week of 172.8. Uh, I think most in the trade have been thinking we'll probably be closer to 170 on this report, but I, that, that number certainly did not shock anyone. So it's a, uh, uh, you know, to, to banter around 170, 172 is not, not a shock to anybody in the trade. Didn't really produce a, uh, a negative reaction per se when it came out. Not that the market performed well anyway. We were still under pressure throughout the entire week. So, uh, but I, I think the, the difficult thing looking ahead, I mean, there's just no threat out there. I mean, here we're going to have probably almost 100% of this corn crop pollinate under zero stress. And generally that translates into uh, to large yields. So yeah. it's, uh, it, uh, this crop does, it, you know, in traders' minds and in, in reality probably gets bigger pretty much every week at this point. So. And to that effect, as we watch this, this crop grow larger and larger until we see what's actually happening, we've had a question from, uh, from one of our Facebook viewers, mm -hmm. Paul Kronberg in Wisconsin, is curious, with the prices under pressure as they are, will China and others buy up and build their reserves? with these prices, or is China pretty well tapped out? China is a, in a situation they have a ample reserve of corn, probably a little excess corn. They had a, a very strong crop this year. You know, some of the maneuvers that they have uh, put into place in concerns with the GMOs probably were as much in response to having excess amount of bushels. A difficult time managing the bushels they have at this point in time. Sure, they, they will everybody buys at a certain price, but you know, by, by, uh, by no means will they be a major buyer. One of the, uh, one of the, the last nails in the coffin, I guess you might say this week, was the, and yesterday they announced that they would no longer accept any DDGs from this country that were not uh, certified free of the MIR uh, gene uh, by the USDA. So uh, in essence, they're not going to take any DDGs. So uh, again, just another indication they have more than ample stocks at this point in time. They can be choose to be a little bit picky about what's going to come into the country at this point in time. So. Now, as we look out on the countryside, there's still a lot of producers out there with uh, 13, 14 crop sitting in the bin. Mm -hmm. As we approach harvest, we approach a record harvest, potentially, uh, we're going to need all that bin space. Absolutely. What's the best advice for getting that out of your hands and into the market? You know, I don't know if I would call it best advice at this point. Maybe the only advice, I'm, I'm afraid, it just we, we're on a slippery slope here. You know, not that uh, there, there, is a, there is a kind of a seasonal type pattern in big years where by the time you get to August 1, sometimes you'll see the market stabilize. But, you know, we know that uh, we have this large crop coming. We know the transportation system is going to become taxed, which means basis levels will probably deteriorate if we move closer to harvest. So uh, I think the best move at this point is just to get the bins cleaned out, have that room for the new crop where the new, the new crop prices are offering very ample carry if you want to put it in the bin and try to carry it out into the spring or summer months. But uh, unfortunately, I think if you still have old crop product around, there's uh, not much you can do other than just to turn it, convert it into cash. That's so. right. And I do believe July 15, trading around $4. I mean, exactly. Right just under $4. So it did about a 30 cent premium to the uh, the current December future. So it's, you know, for those with uh, with bin space, it, it should provide a nice return to that uh, to that bin space. All right. So. Well, now let's jump over to the soybean market. We are beginning to see that diversion. We're seeing mm -hmm. that tightness in the old crop versus another potential potentially record crop in the new crop sure. for producers out there with some beans still in the bin. Do you continue to hold and ride this recent rally on old you crop know, beans? To, to push it much more than a few weeks, I think you're, uh, you're, you're, you're living in dangerous territory. You know, it's, it, you're not that far from the, in the south where you could see some early beans come in. So it's, uh, and you know, the trade's very well aware of that. Sure, the processor's going to try to grab whatever inventory he can yet. I mean, they're, they're still good money crushing beans. But that, that said, they know 
know within 30 days there's going to be ample supply out there. So again, I think if you saw a 30 cent, 40 cent rally anytime in the near term here, boy, it's just time to reward it and uh, have those beans move down the road. So. And thoughts on new crop? We're, we're hearing yield reports close to USDA's number. Correct. Which would be a very, very large soybean crop. Still a very large crop. You know, and, and what's really impressive about that is when you consider that kind of acreage or that kind of yield number on the record acreage. And, uh, you know, this week, uh, and you, you covered it earlier in the report, the, the ratings on soybeans have only been better in 1994 and 1992. And I went back and looked at those years, and in each of those years, we set new records for bean yield. So the potential is there. But of course, compared to, let's say, in 1994, we've got 7 million more acres under production, which would tend to dilute the yield a little bit. So if, if we do come out of that 45.2, which is the current USDA number, that's also what Landworth came out from their satellite data, that would actually be very substantial considering this 84 million acres or over 84 million acres planted. And uh, granted, we, we know in beans, in the month of August, Everybody keys in in August. And, you know, strange things could still happen. Most of the weather forecasts that I've seen are, are pretty pleasant. You know, it's, nobody's calling for any major stress. Uh, if we do get moved through there without seeing any reduction in yield, it's, it's going to be pretty tough to... Uh, I mean, I, I think we, we do, at this ten uh, eighty eleven dollars $11 area, which we stand in the new crop beans, I think there is a, a certain amount of risk premium built into that already. So uh, it wouldn't take much to erase that if they don't see any threat during the, uh, the month of August here. Certainly, and certainly so, if the yield data should change in the August report, absolutely. maybe go ahead and make some sales today. Put some money in your pocket. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, now let's jump down. Let's look at the let's look at the livestock numbers. Sure. It's been a compelling story. We've talked about it again and again. Record prices. It's it's almost like we're talking about the stock market. Exactly. When exactly. we're talking cattle, up 750 this week on the fat cattle side. What changed? Why the turnaround from last week to this week? Why the big spike? You know, and, and again, I think the the little dip we had witnessed in the cattle market was really more of a corrective phase. You know, and again, everybody's trying to outguess when are we going to see the numbers rebuild when we're going to see these herds start to turn around. And every time we see a report, it just hasn't quite happened yet. And I think the, uh, the shorts are quick to cover when, uh, when that is the case. And they've been behind the eight ball all year long and, and are going to be uh, very rapid to, uh, to pull that money back in. The other side of the coin, or, and probably the more important side of the coin, is the, not just the domestic demand, but the international demand. I mean, the exports of all of our meat products, but, uh, but certainly uh, pork and uh, beef, it just continues to uh, surprise everyone. Domestically, I, I think some of the some of the bigger shocks have come from the fact that the consumer really isn't backed away yet either. So it's uh, as long as they're willing to pay the price, and uh, maybe this is kind of a little treat when you know, other things maybe haven't been so good over the last few years. But you know we're still going to have a nice meal out there. So it's uh, that has really kept demand very much in check here on the uh, on the all the meat products really. So, so in your analysis, do you see this? Uh waning anytime soon or are we approaching a plateau? You, you know, I, and again, I, I would have to believe so, yes. You know, really, even with the rebound we have in the cattle this week, we're, we're just back approaching what were the previous highs, flirting maybe with a little bit of a new high. Now, the placement number on the cattle on feed report today was a little bit positive. Uh, the marketing's the number on feed was uh, was pretty much average. So it, there's, there's less of a story to continue to push it higher. So it's... Uh, you know, that said, uh, I, I, I personally think yes. I think we're, we're stretching that rubber band uh, extremely far. Uh, now, are we going to go through a massive wipeout to the downside? Probably not. You know, like I say, unless the consumer, for whatever reason, all of a sudden has decided he doesn't like the taste of beef anymore, you know, that, that seems pretty unlikely here at this point in time. Now, we are tail end of summer. That does tend to trim demand a little bit, could soften things as we move into the fall months. So. Now let's jump over real quick and look at feeder cattle. We've seen fat cattle mm -hmm. continue to rise, corn continue to fall. It's getting bit into feeder prices. Can that continue indefinitely? You know, it's uh, right now they've, they've got that double whammy, particularly with the corn market continuing to move lower and lower. And, you know, here again, too, the uh, without any real so strong signs that we're rebuilding herds. And again, you throw in the whole situation in uh, California and other pasture areas where the pastures are not improving. It's... Uh, you know, right now it's, uh, you know, I don't want to say the sky's the limit, but I mean, there's, there's really nothing that would seem to stand in the way of this feeder price staying up in the uh, levels is at right now. Jeez. So. Now, uh, let's take in and uh, look at the hog market. We have seen, this is the second second weekly decline mm -hmm. we've seen in hog prices. Sure. Are we starting to see the industry respond or, or uh, 
excuse me, grow? Grow. You know, the, uh, and I think that's the perception. And, and I, I think it's a correct perception. You know, the, um, my, my family is very active in the, in the hog business. And uh, yes, I mean, there are seeing demands for people either wanting to expand herds, build new facilities. And, but, you know, that's nothing immediate. You know, I think that's more of a psychological edge there right now. Uh, the great side is, you know, we have here, we, as with the beef, we have not seen really any, uh, or at least very negligible uh, slack in demand uh, in face of these uh, these higher prices over the last 12 months. But but that said, you know the uh, and, and I think the same thing we're going to face in the cattle at some point. You know we're, we're we, you've absorbed the news. We know where the reductions are in the herd. You've kind of calmed down the uh, the threat of even that second wave of the uh, PED virus. So uh, yes, the numbers are rebuilding. And again, we can turn them around a little bit faster than we can turn around cattle herds. So that does seem to be in the works at this point. Are we ever, you know, when you see a correction, they can be severe, don't take me wrong. But, you know, I, I think one of the realities of what's happened now in the last 12 months is we really brought the livestock sector back into par with so many of the other sides of agriculture, the price of ground, the price of grain. And it's, uh, I had mentioned earlier last week, I had the opportunity to go to the Kansas City Federal Reserve Ag Symposium and very, very livestock centric there. And I think most of the, uh, the people that I uh, heard present there really kind of feel this is we've moved back to the era of the livestock producer. A lot again. of interest in that sector. Absolutely. Thanks for taking the time to be with us, Dan. Absolutely. My pleasure. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Dan and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll examine the market impact of the government's latest estimates on unemployment. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.